I did. Now you remember Jesus gives us a picture and he says that he, the lamb, will sit on the throne and sheep and goats will come in and he'll divide them. And the, and w and the main thing we notice is, you know, I'm a sheep and y'all are the goats or something. We always look, you know, we're always, about, we're always weighing ourselves in every statement and everything like that. But one of the things to notice is that there's a great dividing. There's a great dividing of kind. That's important because the book of Revelation is particularly along those lines, particularly all the way through almost. <clears throat> um, but I will say this, that also in the book of Revelation is the development of kind. The development of kind. <clears throat> All right, in, um, in uh, let's see, in Revelation 4, 1, after this I looked and behold a, a door was opened in heaven and the voice that I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said come up here and I will show thee I will show thee things that must happen after this in other words and if what I just said is true then the things that he wants to show us is the things that must happen that need to happen after this so that we don't just you know be Christian beasts <clears throat> but that that conformity to the image of the lamb happens and so this voice that is calling us out of this because see this is where we this is where we judge and evaluate this is where the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was right down here and this is where we look and this is where we measure and this is where we judge and this is where we we're all caught up in and this is where we see ourselves uh, and again remember our, our first class uh, we were talking about this and we said that God doesn't really see us in that frame. He sees us as wandering in the wilderness or, you know, in the different people that are throughout there and he sees us either one with them, you know, that we're of that kind uh, and we make the same kind of decisions and we have the same kind of wants and desires. And, and um, <clears throat> so um, there is this, there is this desire to bring us out of this. You can say there's a desire to bring us, so we see from above, but just as powerfully, I mean, if you go to Jesus, you leave something, amen? The problem is, we found a way to go to Jesus down here and stay down here, okay? Um, if you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. For you're dead down here. But when he who is your life appears, then you'll appear with him in glory. All right. <clears throat> so um, we had the appearance of the lamb in chapter 5 <clears throat> and, uh, and verse 6. And I, and I beheld and lo, and I beheld, behold the lamb, and I beheld, I, I think it made an impression on him. Because he was looking for a lion. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and um, you could say in the midst of the central figure on the throne. He's the central figure on the throne. In the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So here we get a description, a, a leading description of the lamb. You get a, an early, you get, this is just the, really the first appearance once you're out of this realm and seeing things like good and evil, Christian, not Christian, good Christian versus bad Christian. All of that's the law. I'm telling you it is. It is exactly what the law was, and it's exactly what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil loves to feed off of, is law and judgments that are made. Um, and so this is the early seeing of the Lamb. It is not the full, it is not seeing him as 
uh, husband and groom are seeing us as the wife of the lamb yet, is it? That, that's, there's some things that have to go, be gone through for that to happen. It doesn't just happen. Well, I've been a Christian 10 years. I think I'm getting close to it. It has nothing to do with how long you've been a Christian. It has everything to do, it has everything to do with, with viewing, with seeing the lamb, with seeing Jesus as the lamb, and in seeing him, realizing what that is, what is its substance, what is its nature, and then, frankly, falling in love with it. Enough to, to let it move you, enough to make it draw your heart out, enough to make you commit it, you know. I mean, you know, look at marriage, you know, all the divorces and stuff like that. You can, you can have a paper and you can even say the words, I commit to you above everybody else in the world. That doesn't work any good. But if you really, 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 you really, really love somebody, you want to be with them. And that's just a fact. That's just a fact. So, uh, he appears, and when he appears, the people, there, there begins to be a response. Um, verse 8, starting with verse 8. And when he had taken the scroll, the four and living creatures and, and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb. They fell down before the Lamb. Now, does that sound like anything? I mean, these seem to be the ones that are there closest to the Lamb. Well, Mary of Bethany fell down before the Lamb. Um, and um, having every one of them harps and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song. So this is a new song, and it has to do with the Lamb. They sang a new song. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open its seals, for thou wast slain. For thou wast slain. You're worthy because you were slain. And, but he was slain for others. He, would, he did not die selfishly, and he did not die a martyr's death as we understand martyr's death, that you die for a cause. Jesus didn't die for a cause. We have people in militaries all over the world in different militaries, and they're all dying for their cause. Um, uh, Thou art worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God. And so here we see that the redemption from, from the heavenly point of view is not redeemed us from hell. It is not redeemed us from punishment for what we've done wrong. It is a pure redemption. It is pure. Redemption money was silver. It is pure. And it is a redeemed to God. It is not the motive is not to redeem them to himself. It is to redeem us to God. It is, and again, we're always trying to be redeemed out of something. And even our prayers, most of the time, we're all, you know, it's a form of a redemption prayer, salvation prayer. Save me from this, save me from that, save me from this. Jesus, the Lamb of God, wants to redeem us to God. Why? Because the scripture says that, God, that we are supposed to be conformed to the image of Christ. Is that true or not? But it says when Jesus came, he was the express image of God. So if he's the lamb, he's Christ crucified, he's, he's what God is like. We're supposed to be like him because he's what God is like. He's trying to redeem us to God. He's trying to get us into that flow of the trinity of selflessness redeemed us to God by thy blood out of not from you're not redeemed uh, the wording here is that uh, by thy blood out of, he's taking us out of something. 
and put us in God. He's put us in another spirit. He's put us in another family. He's taking us from, we say, well, the, the Muslim countries, they're beasts. You know, I wish I had my little, I wish I had my little thing right here. I don't know, I doubt that I do. I'd love to get in trouble right now. I feel in a mood to get in trouble. I'm sorry this has taken a bit, but it is, would be a great opportunity for me to share what was on my heart. Okay, I'm not seeing it, so I'm gonna give you the rough draft of it because my book is full here. It's called, I'm offended by Muslims. I wish I did have it here so I could do it. Can you even say that without going to prison or something? I'm offended by Muslims. I'm offended by their hair trigger response to somebody that criticizes them. I'm offended by the fact that they uh, mistreat the women that they do. I'm offended by the fact that they get offended over anything that anybody else does in their religion, but they, want, they don't want anybody to be offended over them. I'm offended by them because they hold themselves in that, that manner against everybody else. And I want to also add, I'm offended by Christians who do the same things, people who claim to be part of the Lamb. It's all beast. I'm offended by everything that is Muslim, if that is in that spirit, and Christian that is in that spirit, because it's an offense to the nature and spirit of the Lamb. So I'm offended by it. Now take that, put that on the web, and watch how soon I die. But I am. I'm offended. I'm offended by it, and I'm not ashamed that I'm offended by it at all. And I'm not afraid to say I'm offended by it because I'm offended by the same thing in me if it shows up. And I'm offended by the same thing in you if it shows up. And I'm offended by it in them just as much as anybody else. Not more, not less. It's all beast. It's all self-centered. It's all wanting everything to go their way. It's all measuring everything by their standards. We do the same things. We do the same things. So now to find my way back to. <clears throat> All right. So what you have um, is uh, uh, like verse 10 here. And has made us under our God a kingdom of priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands sang with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. And every creature that is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in the, them heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. So you get an idea. This is the, this is the, when I, when I was reading this, and I got chills right now when I was reading this, I'm, I'm, I'm John, I walk, I'm taken up into this door, and I'm now, everything I'm going to see is going to be different. It's going to have a different taste. It's going to have a different smell. It's going to be different in substance. Everything about it is going to be different. And I'm, I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm bowled over in a certain sense because it's not the way I was trained, I was one of the 12 disciples. Jesus looked like this guy that was the best of all guys. Not everything and everybody and, and looking at him and 
I don't see his, his beard. I don't see his sandals. I don't see that. I see blood. I see open wounds. I see a, a slaughtered little puny lamb slaughtered. And everything around us, heaven, earth, under the earth, everything is going worthy. It's the, the slain, slaughtered lamb. And I'm going, this is mind-blowing. This is not, this is not, I almost said, this is not Christian. <laughs> this is not the way we see. We're too busy like the seven churches down here trying to get this right and messing up here and da-da-da-da and got all this mixture and all this stuff going on and living down here and trying to get God to fix it all. Trying to get God to fix it all. And as you saw in our last class, a bunch of his responses were, be faithful unto death, or, or you are where Satan dwells. Stay there and manifest the testimony, you know, instead of, so you walk around up there and you go, this is nothing like Christianity. And someone would say, it's not, we're not Christians up here. You understand what I'm saying? We're, we're one with the Lamb. <laughs> you know, it's like, where's the hymn books? <laughs> or whatever, it's stupid. I'm sorry, but it's just ridiculous in light of heavenly truth as seen from his viewpoint. So, um, let me just read. <clears throat> uh, worshiping, following, and becoming one with the lamb, which is bride. Worshiping, following, and becoming one with, and, and a lot of times I'll say one with lamb, because we'll, I don't know, you see there's a nature there then that it just kind of draws you into. <clears throat> the book draws us toward the lamb and his nature throughout. throughout. John is taken out of the earth and given a view of the way God sees from above. While at first, uh, at first uh, we see all people worshiping a lamb in Revelation 5, the rest of the book does not confine that worship merely while around a throne, but draws it out into the framework of a living worship in the world in the midst of beasts. <laughs> now you're going to worship. Yes. Now, you know, don't you remember what, what Abraham taking Isaac to offer him and he's got three, or he's got some guys with him, stuff like that, and they get to the bottom of Mount Moriah, which just like Mount Calvary is going to go up there, altar's going to be built, and this, his son is going to die. And he turns to the guys and he says, stay here with the stuff. Me and my son are going to go up to worship. They didn't get up there and go, Hallelujah! Yes, yes! Glory! They went up there and worshiped the way God called worship, and that was always an altar. Whether it was Moses or whether it was Noah, this was how they worshiped. This was what they understood worship to be. David was the first one to really introduce something along that line, and you remember what I shared on that. It was his heart that something be before the Lord like Mary of Bethany constantly. That's what was in his heart. We've taken that way out. It was supposed to be true sacrifice, the sacrifice of praise, but it was supposed to be sacrifice, not praise. You understand what I mean? Sacrifice of praise. <clears throat> and so... Um, so the rest of the book of Revelation does not confine worship merely while around a throne. Amen. But it draws it out into the framework of a living worship in the world and in the midst of beasts. There we prove that we adore, we worship, we give adoration, we, we honor 
You see, and that's true honor, isn't it? That in the framework of the, all of that kind of stuff and to be able to manifest and give testimony to the lamb on the throne. This is testimony to him. This is true honor. <clears throat> We're challenged to become lambs ourselves as we become followers of the lamb. This is the path that leads to the ultimate relationship with the lamb, wife of the lamb, as discovered in the latter part of the book. If this premise for the book is valid, then the central focus must be upon a slaughtered little lamb. It must be, and it will be. See, it doesn't have to mention, for example, the, uh, the, the, the two witnesses. It doesn't have to mention the name lamb. It just has to manifest him. And boy, did they do it in a huge way. And what does it say? They, they were, uh, they ministered on earth until came time to give testimony to the lamb, which was death give themselves. We'll get into all that as we go. <clears throat> um, we give, we must, the central focus must be a slaughtered little lamb. Only a passing glance will not work here. We must use our seeing abilities from every angle. We must even notice the reaction of everything around him because that's what this seeing, remember we use that as one of the examples. You don't you don't see the object, you see the stuff. He was looking around and he was also seeing not the object at that moment, but the reaction of everything to him, everything to him. This is it. This is the central focus. This is the thing that God has exalted above everything else. And we bow to that because we accept that. We do more than accept, but we accept that judgment. That slaughtered lamb is it. And, every, and he's watching and he's just going, everything. And up and down, side, everything, everything is focused in on that right there. We must even notice the reason of, of everything around him. He has been enthroned by God above everyone else and all else worships him. But what we must discover in the course of our search is just what it means to worship this lamb, what it means, what it means. We do, we need that. If we don't have that, then we're gonna assume that it means to come to a church and have beautiful music flow over us and so that we can feel in a right mood and we can feel the spirit. You know, I wonder how many people that have truly died by that spirit felt, felt wonderful things. They, you know, I mean, I know that Stephen is sitting there, but see, he's not looking at the circumstances. He's looking at the lamb who stood also, and he's looking at him, and the stones are hitting him. And it, you get the feeling that he just fell asleep in the arms of the Lord. But I don't know that it was angels were singing. I doubt that. It doesn't say that it was. And he's going, oh, oh this music makes me want to worship. You know, y'all you, know that. Y'all know certain music makes us want to worship. But can we worship when there's no music and, and beasts are all around us and, and gnawing at us? And the, question, and, and the answer to that is maybe not yet. That's why the book of Revelation is written. It is to show the path. We're not, you know, when John first gets up there, he doesn't measure him, and he doesn't even measure everything by the fullness of that truth yet. He's just taking it in. But he'll, he'll proceed and see what's going on. This is what's going on with God. This is how he sees everything. We just see it as, uh, can you believe the stock market's down and gas is up? You know, I mean, we're just, we got all these, you know, we're just so, so into this world. <clears throat> uh, 
what it means to worship. The call of this book is to worship, give homage, and to adore a slaughtered lamb. And I mean that in the most real terms. I know that we go, I love you, Jesus, and you're the lamb of God. But, you know, it's like I, I'm really more in love with the guy with the robe and sandals and beard. You know, I mean, that's the way. I, and I understand that because that's how the book starts. It's, it's Jesus that comes to them. And I understand that. But this book is telling us that we're going to have to move on into who he is and not just what he's done for us and the good feelings that he's given us in the process of that. <clears throat> Um, to, to adore a slaughtered lamb. The worship that shall be developed progressively throughout the book should not be based primarily on the advantage to us in terms of salvation from hell, but should center attention on the degree of selflessness resident in him. In other words, we are worshiping the lamb that was slain. We're not just thankful that he was slain for the benefits that keep me out of hell. Does that make sense? That, that it is a, it is, it's him now. The worship is getting more, the focus is getting sharper, and it's not allowing for a whole lot of this other stuff. Not that it's not important to, you know, thank God we're saved, amen, glory to God, but nothing will compare to him. Nothing, and if it does, we got a problem. <laughs> This one image is the focus of the book and meant to be the focus of our lives. That worship in vocal terms has to do with verbally expressing the worthiness of the lamb to be given such high honor and exaltation. You, lamb, are worthy. The high point comes when the object of our praise is identified as the lamb that was slain and we're honoring that. That involves a major recognition of what God honors above all else. Because that wherefore every knee shall bow. Wherefore, remember that in Philippians 2? You know, he you know, it says nothing about him dying for our salvation in Philippians 2. It is all the selflessness of, of that giving. <clears throat> That involves a major recognition of what God honors above all else, one by which they will one day be defined themselves. That image is an image by which one day they too will be defined. Who are you? Oh, we're the ones saved out of this country and that country and this and that. That's what you are in the beginning. But after a while, you're defined by the Lamb. We are. Who are you? We are followers of the lamb and that doesn't mean you know if he goes to palm beach i'm going too it means the way that he proceeds as lamb i'm following in that also <clears throat> But with the progression of the book, those who are around the throne verbally exalting the Lamb will, in chapter 7 and 14, be called upon to follow the Lamb in his ways. <clears throat> All right, so let me just in interject this right here. The book of Revelation um, is, is different scenes that are really in, in almost all of those scenes are pictures of the Lamb, either him in his selfless giving or us in some form or not, whether it be the two witnesses or whatever else, okay? Um, they, they have to do, and, and well, let me say this. The scenes are usually beasts in the way that they are, and then there are interludes within, like little interlude chapters within the book. And those interludes take you totally out of the beast realm and all the stuff that's going on and how hard it is and it begins to show someone who is who then enters that and does it by the lamb and follows the lamb in it and every time that there is a death and a self-giving 
Immediately it's followed in the book of Revelation by the highest praise and everything's jerked up into heaven and says, yes, glory to God. And it's usually we lost. But we didn't lose. It's like the lamb. We, that, he didn't lose on Calvary, but it appeared defeat because we don't understand victory. Not, not according to the way the, the Lord's mind is. We'll get into the explanations of that a little more clearly where I can show you as we go here. Um, <clears throat> so we're be, we'll be called upon to follow the lamb in his ways. They become followers of a slaughtered lamb, not just a lamb. The ones designated as the followers of the lamb will have their lives defined by trials meant to contrast, develop, and evaluate where they are in relationship to the Lamb. Okay, so the Lord is testing. The Lord is, the Lord is measuring. You see this in the book of Ezekiel. What, a, what an incredible picture we get in the, the book of Ezekiel of what the book of Revelation is about. Incredible. Incredible. You, you know, it would, it would behoove you sometime in the future if you ever got the chance, you know, the Lord may have his own different place right now. But to go through, particularly like the, the end part, like chapter 40 on through, where you begin to read and then compare as you read to the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, it gives you incredible definitions of that. But the, but the definitions in themselves, if you don't see that, you'll, they'll just be words to you. you won't, it won't define anything because you haven't really looked at Ezekiel to see what he was trying to address. I, you know what? I'm probably going to write a book or newsletter or something on that I've got I've got to it's just it's just too incredibly precious um, and maybe I'm in the book of Revelation so much because I have apocalypse <laughs> I speak of the apocalypse Sorry. Um, <clears throat> the goal is to have his life, his image, and his nature formed in us. To do this demands the presence of defeat. Not just trials. It demands defeat. It does. You, there will be no manifestation of the true lamb. See, we think just holding our breath and going through it, we call that the faith of patience. <laughs> it's not. The faith and patience of the saints has to do with believing life out of death and staying in it. All right. So um, to do this demands the presence of defeat, for this is how the lamb overcame. Amen. He that overcomes, this is how the lamb overcame. <clears throat> we are expected by God to follow slaughtered lamb wherever he goes. There is a, clean, a cleansing that takes place when what we put on has been saturated with lamb's blood. Let's look at that. That's over in Revelation chapter 7. <clears throat> Uh, Revelation 7, verse 9 and 10, start there. <clears throat> After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues, stood before the throne uh, and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and, and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Um, and then verses uh, 13 and 14. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, Who are these who are arrayed in white robes? And from where did they come? Remember, they're, they're clothed in white robes, but uh, who are these? These, let's see, where was I? 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, 
These are they who came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. There's a cleansing by poured out blood. And by the way, my translation here says the great tribulation. What if the great tribulation was something every one of us had to go through, the darkest part of our life where we would prove that lamb had been formed in us? And I'm not saying it is, but I'm just saying, what if that was it? Because every generation before would say, thank God I missed the great tribulation. <laughs> yeah, maybe, and maybe they didn't and they failed, but anyway, that's another story. <laughs> it is also uh, a call to we who have or us who have not yet striven under blood to be prepared to follow his selfless giving into dangerous waters those dangerous waters contain all sorts of trials enemies sufferings and beasts that seek to destroy a slaughtered lamb and his followers. Dangerous waters. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to test you. Dangerous waters are worse than a fiery trial. Would you not agree with that? I mean, they are. Dangerous waters must be filled with all of these things. Trials, enemies. What, what do we mean by enemies? People that are against us. You know, I mean, should, should, should not at least the priesthood been on Jesus' side? You know, and they're, they're the ones plotting against him. You know, that's enough that if you had power, you'd just go, I'm just going to kill you all, every priest. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> but lamb has power and doesn't use it. See, we say I'm a lamb because I, I'm not doing anything against them. We may not have any power to do it. And so then, we're, you know, we say we're a lamb. We're not. We just don't have any power. Jesus is the lamb of God in a real way because he had complete power and didn't use it at all. He just laid back into death. <clears throat> Let me try to finish this and then we'll quit here. In fact... In fact, I'm going to reread that and we're going to quit. Those dangerous, let's see, I'm going to read that. It is, <clears throat> it is also a call to we who have not yet striven under blood, we haven't gone through it yet, to be prepared to follow his selfless giving. <clears throat> we're following the lamb into it, into dangerous waters. Those dangerous waters contain all sorts of trials, enemies, suffering. Do you, you do realize suffering means that you suffer? I mean, you know, I've seen people say, oh, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Long-suffering means you're going to suffer for a long time for God's sake. You know, but we, it's... It's clumped in this, like, oh, yes, the fruit of the Spirit is, you know, if we get about that far into it. We really don't even get that far. We get about that far into it, and then there's no more love, joy, or peace because we're suffering so long. Hello! <laughs> I mean, it's the truth. If he had left that one out, it would have been okay. Temperance, which means self-control. Okay, well, we can kick that one out, too. <laughs> Suffering and beasts. And the beasts, the, the, one of the main features of the beasts is that they take away all control and they take all away all ability to fight back. And so the beast in us that wants to strike back can't. And so then we become more deeply frustrated because you know, you, you know the old deal, I mean, uh, around my house with three brothers and two sisters and a 
the alcoholic stepfather and everything, you know, the sheetrock had holes all in the walls. Ah! All the frustration that'd be pent up and all of the abuse and all this stuff and you just, you just get mad, bam, you just knock a hole in that wall. But when the beast gets control, he takes away all ability to strike back and you are stuck with the beast inside of you that can be way worse than that beast because he's ripping at your very soul, you know. So I'm telling you, when the beasts rise, and they don't, they don't start rising until chapter 12. When the beasts start rising, and first, the first one to come is the great red dragon. And then the beast out of the sea, and then a beast out of the land. You better, you know, by then, and you know, that's the same chapter that says they overcame them. Hello, by then, this thing needs to start being in gear. Beasts that seek to destroy a slaughtered lamb and his followers. It's not per this is not persecution because you're a Christian. I mean, is that, is that, uh, that should be very clear to us. We're always going, well, y'all, I have to put up a persecution on my job. Somebody said, so you're a Christian. <laughs> they hurt my feelings. You know, my God. Wait till the beasts come. Because they have, they got tricks and plans. And most of their attention, I'm just going to tell you right now, is pointed toward the Lamb and his followers, not toward Christians. Think about it. Father, we just come in Jesus' name and <clears throat> we do wanna think about it. We wanna meditate on your word. We, we, wanna, we wanna see not some end time scenario that's gonna happen probably not while we're alive. We wanna see the scenarios as things that we must face by Christ crucified as our life, not just because we're Christians. We ask you to open our hearts and eyes that, uh, that we would see that the end of law and the end of grace is neither law nor grace, it's beast or lamb. And that in seeing that, we will not align ourselves with a new covenant. We will align ourselves with a slaughtered lamb. We ask you, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.